Being in position as the preflop raiser is usually a very favorable situation to be in, especially since we're usually up against a wide calling range from the big blind. But in tournaments, we'll often be playing against the small blind instead of the big blind, and this forces us to adapt our approach. Many players make mistakes in these spots, so if you're looking to avoid some of the most common errors, you've come to the right place. Hi Wizards, I'm Matt Hunt, and today we're going to explore how our in-position c-bet strategy against the small blind differs from how we would usually play against the big blind. Before we start the video, we'd really appreciate it if you could hit the like and subscribe buttons. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you, and enjoy the video. We're going to start by looking at some broad strokes comparisons of the preflop ranges we'll be up against when the small blind calls, since preflop ranges are going to heavily influence the overall nature of postflop play. We'll then move on to looking at how our general CBET frequencies are going to alter as a result of these different preflop ranges. And then finally, we'll take a look at a couple of specific scenarios to illustrate the differences in our strategies. We're just going to be using chip EV ranges for the time being to keep things fairly simple, and we're going to have Hero opening from the hijack in all the spots as well, just for consistency. First, let's look at a deep stacked spot with 100 big blind stacks. On the left, you can see what the big blind's call range would look like against the hijack open. On the right, it's the small blind. Clearly, the range is a lot tighter, and it's a lot heavier on pairs and suited hands. In fact, since we're deep stacked and many of the suited hands are mixing in 3 bets at some rate, the pairs are by far the most dense region of hands here, which immediately makes the small blinds range quite strong. There are also some offsuit broadways and suited aces in there, giving the range a little more coverage on some of the high card boards, and ensuring that it isn't overly condensed into the lower card or middle card region of the deck. If we switch up the sim and look at 50 big blinds, not much is really changing. The big blind range is even wider, and the small blind range is perhaps a little more dense to suited aces and kings, given that there's a bit less mixing in the 3-bet region, but otherwise the two ranges are relatively similar. At 30 big blinds, the big blind range gets wider still, while it includes fewer pairs, since many of them will shove pre-flop. The same is somewhat true of the small blind range, but deuces through sixes are still in there at a good rate. The suited ace region is now heavily favoring calling, as is the suited middle card region. This gives the small blind range a lot better board coverage on high card boards, in exchange for slightly weakening it on some of the lower card boards. Overall, we can conclude relatively easily that the small blind range will always be much tighter and more condensed than the big blinds range at all stack sizes, and that it's going to generally be very heavy on suited hands, due to a need for high post-flop equity realization to counter the disadvantage of being out of position. It's also going to be quite dense to middle card hands, generally containing cards between a 7 and a queen, although as we get shallower there will be slightly more suited ace and suited king coverage in there. And finally, it will almost always contain the pocket pairs from deuces to sixes at some rate, even once we get down to somewhat shallow stacks of 30 big blinds. Now, let's take a look at how these differences in preflop construction manifest themselves in our postflop strategy. I've grouped together our bet sizings for the following charts to keep things a bit more manageable, We've got small, medium, large, and overbet sizings here. For the first spot at 100 big blinds, there are a couple of differences visible immediately. Our overbets have virtually disappeared, and our checking frequency has gone up by almost 20%. Right away, this is telling us our strategy is fundamentally different against the small blind. There are almost no boards where we possess a significant enough nut hands advantage to allow us to use an overbet strategy. And there are far more problematic boards on which we have to check at a high rate. Our large bet frequency also goes down in conjunction with the overbet. The other interesting change is that the frequency with which we bet small has gone down, but the medium bet has stayed more or less the same. A couple of things are happening here. First, the small blind's range contains far fewer weak suited hands than the big blind, so the small bet is less effective in applying pressure to the bottom of our opponent's range. And in addition, many of the spots where we might bet large or overbet against the big blind are now less favorable for us. In short, what's happening is that a lot of overbet spots or large bet spots are now becoming medium bet spots, while a lot of small bet spots are now causing us to lean towards either checking more or sometimes betting slightly bigger if we do choose to bet. As a result, the medium bet size is still fairly effective here even while the larger and smaller bet sizes become less favorable. If we look at 50 big blind stacks, we can see a similar thing happening. In fact, the medium bet size is actually being used considerably more often here to the point where it becomes a pretty important part of our approach. 
Once again, the overbet and large bet sizes are much less prominent, while the checking frequency has gone way up. The small bet frequency has also decreased, with a lot of those spots again becoming spots where we might either check or use a medium bet size. At 30 big blind stacks, the trend is slightly altered on account of the lower overall SPR. We're now at a point where the overbet wasn't really used much, even against the big blind. The large bet is now becoming less effective, and so is the medium bet. We're essentially just scaling down our sizing overall now that we're shallower stacked. The small bet sizing is still quite effective here, although given that we're still checking much more often than we would against the big blind, we're mostly just seeing a lot of the other sizing scaled down towards a small bet, while the small bet itself scales down towards a check. Next, let's take a look at how certain specific types of flops might influence our overall frequencies at the 50 big blind stack size, just to get a sense of which spots are the most negative for us against the small blind. If we look purely at texture, we can see that the drop-off in our frequency on rainbow flops is slightly less significant than the drop-off on other boards, indicating that the board being rainbow is still a pretty favorable event for us. Overall though, it doesn't seem like overall texture is influencing our approach that much, although it is notable that we're now c-betting less than half the time on monotone flops, mostly due to how easy it is for the small blind to flop a flush. If we filter by flop pairing, we can see that paired boards are also still very good for us, since our range will always contain a higher density of the stronger pocket pairs. The same is mostly true for tripled boards. However, unpaired boards cause us to slightly reevaluate, given that our opponent will have fewer trashy hands which miss the flop altogether, as we've already mentioned. With regard to connectivity, one interesting thing happens. Because our opponent no longer possesses as many offsuit connector hands when they're in the small blind, the drop-off in our CBAT frequency on the connected boards is less significant since it's still quite hard for the small blind to flop a straight or two pair. However, on the semi-connected boards, since a lot of those boards will contain two middle cards, we're now forced to be a lot more cautious against the middle card dense small blind range. Finally, the most revealing factor here which makes a difference to our approach is simply to look at the flop according to its high card. We can see that while low card boards were previously the most dangerous type of board for us against the big blind, that's no longer true. In fact, we can see bet the lower card boards very slightly more often when we're up against the small blind. By contrast, our frequency on any kind of board with a Broadway card on it has massively decreased. Even the Queen Jack or Ten High boards are no longer especially good for us, causing our CBET frequency to drop below 65%. Immediately from this data, we can tell that even one Broadway card being present on the flop is enough to drastically alter our CBET strategy against the small blind. So if we try to draw some conclusions from all of this info, a few things are fairly clear. First, we definitely have to check a lot more versus the small blind at all stack sizes, usually around 20% more often. We're less likely to be able to get away with range betting for a small size, and we're very unlikely to be able to overbet at all on any boards. In particular, we should be much more cautious on any board with a Broadway card, while we actually don't have to be quite so cautious on lower card boards. Two other things to remember here which we can't explore in depth just yet are the influence of donk bet ranges and ICM. In all of these sims, the small blind was allowed a 33% pot donk bet strategy, and on many boards the solver was taking this approach at a reasonable rate, including with many of the small blind's strong hands. If we removed this donk bet option, it would strengthen the small blind's checking range and force us to reduce our c-bet frequency even further. In addition, if we started to account for ICM when evaluating the small blind's preflop range, we would see the range tighten up even further, which would force us to become even more passive post-flop. It's not inconceivable at all that if we ran a spot where the small blind flatted with an ICM pre-flop range and then never donk bet the flop, we would probably find some spots where our c-bet frequency dropped to only 20 to 30% overall. To wrap up this video, let's take a quick look at a couple of case study scenarios from the GTO Wizard archive. First, let's look at a 50 big blind spot on a board of King, Queen, Deuce with two hearts. On the left, we can see our strategy for this board against the big blind. We have some overbets to leverage the fact that villain can only have one of the sets, deuces, and we have a variety of other sizes used as well, including a fairly high frequency of small bets aiming to apply pressure to the bottom of the big blind's range. We only have a 22% checking frequency, and our checking range is fairly heavy on showdown value hands. On the right, we can see the same spot against the small blind, our overbets have disappeared because we no longer have enough of a nut hands advantage, even though the small blind still can't have kings or queens. We still have some large and medium bets, except this time we no longer have almost any small bets at all. There's no trash in the range for us to target with that sizing, and the best we can do is use the large and medium sizings to target some of the pocket pairs. 
To look at another example, let's take this 10-3 deuce monotone flop. On the left, we can see that this is a range bet board against the big blind. They have a lot of offsuit hands in their preflop range, and they don't have many of the two pair hands here. We're even able to bet medium at some rate, despite the fact that this is a monotone board where small bets would usually be best. This sizing is applying pressure to some of the 3x and deuce x hands in the big blinds range here. Against the small blind, however, the medium bets completely disappear because all that 3x and deuce x is no longer there, and the checking frequency goes all the way up to over 50%. This board gives the small blind a lot of top pairs and a good number of flushes, so we simply can't be anywhere near as aggressive here as we could when called by the big blind. It's important to note that even though the big blind is calling with a lot of suited hands, in fact virtually all suited hands, pre-flop, that's not enough to cause us to slow down, because they also usually have plenty of offsuit hands which cannot flop flushes. However, when the small blind has a range of mostly suited hands, broadways, and pairs, it's a lot harder for them to have flopped absolutely nothing on this board, which is part of why all our bets are less effective here. So after looking at these case studies, let's bring it all back together with some conclusions. Obviously, we can't treat small blind spots the same way we treat the big blind. We can't just blindly range bet certain boards. The small bet overall is a lot less effective, and we have to be a lot more selective with how we choose our betting ranges, especially on those boards with a Broadway card, which we identified earlier. This becomes even more relevant when the small blind's preflop range contracts even further, for any reason, either because of ICM, or simply because the small blind plays too tight overall. And if they never donk bet the flop on any board, which is true for many players in the small blind, then their checking range becomes stronger still, which forces us to focus more on equity realization as opposed to taking an aggressive CBET strategy. That's all for this video. If you have any questions, you can find me in the GTO Wizard Discord server and I'll be happy to answer them. In the meantime, good luck everyone and thanks for watching.